I feel like we all know about shallow invocations of girl boss feminism. Uh, do you think Margaret Thatcher had girl power? Yes, of course. Do you think she effectively utilized girl power by funneling money to illegal paramilitary death squads in Northern Ireland? I don't know about that. I am going to use the shit out of that clip today. But I, I fear that when we talk about this kind of neoliberal or bourgeois feminism, we, and I do mean men especially here, but the left generally, uh, we can fall into this trap of seeing it either as just, you know, empty and ridiculous or as evidence for dismissing feminism as a cause entirely. With some men, I think, using it as an excuse to just release some misogyny against women they don't like. All these reactions are, I think, different degrees of wrong. Uh, and given the apparent dominance of, of dudes in my YouTube audience, And never mind whether or not dudes rock. Yeah, dudes, dudes rock. rock. Dudes hey. rock. Yeah. I think it's worth exploring the emergence of this kind of bourgeois neoliberal feminism. Why it's not just silly, but deeply dangerous and useful to neoliberal Western capitalism. How it's rooted in white supremacy and why retaining an alternative uh, counter hegemonic form of feminism in the face of the neoliberal girl boss is absolutely essential to any anti-capitalist movement. So if you're a dude in my audience and you're thinking, I'm not really that interested in feminism, stick around because patriarchy is absolutely inseparably tied together with class and capitalism and dudes will never be able to freely rock until all gender depression is overcome. Yeah, dudes, dudes rock. rock. Dude. That's right. The girl boss as a phenomenon is obviously deeply linked with capitalism. I mean, it's in the name. But such forms of neoliberal capitalism will never be emancipatory for any gender because patriarchy as it exists today is fundamentally entwined with capitalism. The two systems are not separate, but one and the same. As Federici shows in her influential examination of patriarchal and capitalist development, Caliban and the Witch, the development of capitalism interacted with pre-existing forms of gender depression, became entangled with and altered those structures into new forms of capitalist patriarchy, initially through the genocidal violence of the European witch hunts. Yeah, it wouldn't be a JTD video without a mention of genocide. And through this reconstruction of patriarchy under capitalism that we could label as primitive accumulation, women were initially excluded from waged work and confined to the often invisible form of social reproductive labour. <laughs> Reproduction. <laughs> I just got that, yeah. That is labour which not only reproduces people, you know, through childbearing, but reproduces society as a whole through things like healthcare, social care, education, domestic work, all of which have been traditionally delegated to women in society. And through these social reproductive activities, the commodity of labour power is produced as the one commodity which is produced outside of what we could traditionally see as the uh, traditional capitalist production process. Say this is a, a scarf made of linen and it's produced in a factory for scarves made of linen that is made in the commodity process. But labour power as a commodity, which is essential to the whole process, isn't produced in a factory. You can't produce labour in a factory, but you can produce it in a social factory. A society. Previous to capitalism, women were obviously still subordinate under patriarchal systems. But there are some crucial ways in which patriarchy was altered, entwined with and regenerated by capitalism. For European serfs, for example, there was no firm distinction between what we would call productive and reproductive labour as there would be later under capitalism. Subsistence farming blurred any distinction that there would be between productive and reproductive labour. Producing the food, maintaining the land, maintaining the household were all part of one productive process. They were all essentially one form of labour. Furthermore, the reproductive work which uh, you could distinguish and which was delegated to women was, unlike in capitalism, a public and community affair. 
whereby women would wash and spin and harvest together as part of a community rather than being isolated in the private sphere of capitalist home life. Now, I don't want to get this twisted. I don't want to give an image that say there was no patriarchal dominance, there was no patriarchy before capitalism, because there obviously was. And Federici herself has been criticised for maybe giving an overly rosy vision of the pre-capitalist past. And I'm not aiming to fall into that trap. Rather, I want to make clear just a few crucial dimensions of patriarchy which are essential to the development of capitalism and which are then essential to the development of the neoliberal girl boss, which we, we will get to soon. Soonish. First was the move from serf subsistence farming to the capitalist wage relation, in which economically productive labour, you know, like making a thing in a factory, was separated from the socially reproductive labour, with the latter being associated with women and given a subordinate role within society where its value was totally obscured. And this is a standard which is still maintained today. And notably, a similar relationship has been found within queer communities in which the bulk of social reproductive labour can fall on feminine subjects. Indicating of course that these sexed and gendered divisions in labour aren't reflective merely of biological realities, but of social relations embedded within and recreated by both society and individuals. I put this little tangent in here because there's a contingent of terfs who've taken Federici's work and interpreted it poorly, in my opinion, uh, in really transphobic ways, uh, in really essentialist ways, and I just wanted to make clear that I don't fuck with that. This is not, this is a biological essentialism free zone, uh, a, a turf free zone. If you're here in a turf, fuck off. The second development of patriarchy within capitalism that I am really interested in here, and which is really relevant for the, for the development of neoliberal girl boss feminism, is the breakdown of community and the establishment of a firm public and private distinction within society, which was further exacerbated by making women even more subordinate to and dependent on men through the reliance of a single wage relation generated by the male-dominated economically productive work. And all of this resulted in the construction of the heteronormative nuclear family as a prime site of patriarchal domination. What if dudes don't rock? That's the question. Whoa! Is he saying dudes don't rock? Yeah, uh, do, but dudes rock. This process, which was born of the extreme genocidal violence of the witch hunts, and which is still reinforced by gendered violence today, peaked in the 19th century with the creation of the full-time housewife, redefined women's position in society and in relation to men. The sexual division of labor that emerged from it not only fixed women to reproductive work, but increased their dependence on men, enabling the state and employers to use the male wage as a means to command women's labor. In this way, the separation of commodity production from the reproduction of labor power also made possible the development of a specifically capitalist use of the wage and of markets as a means for the accumulation of unpaid labor. Most importantly, the separation of production from reproduction created a class of proletarian women who were as dispossessed as men, but unlike their male relatives, in a society that was becoming increasingly monetarized, had almost no access to wages, thus being forced into a condition of chronic poverty, economic dependence, and an invisibility as workers. Through this aspect of primitive accumulation, we can really see how modern categories of gendered oppression develop. You know, the heteronormative nuclear family as a political unit and the devaluing of socially reproductive work and confining it, delegating it to feminine subjects. But more than this, we can see how the development of patriarchy and capitalism together has been to give women as a historically and socially constructed grouping a particular class character. Through placing the burden of a whole section of the production process on the shoulders of women, you know, the social reproduction of labour power, capitalism creates a particular class relation as well as particular gender and sex norms. 
And what this reveals is that there is no easy distinction between identity issues like gender and class politics. Gender itself is often a class relation. Like I said at the start, the systems of capitalism and patriarchy are not two intersecting systems, but they're one system. They're one and the same. But this story is further complicated by the role of colonialism and the construction of whiteness in relation to gender. We will get to the neoliberal girl boss soon, I promise, soon enough. One particular weakness of bourgeois feminism over the years has been to ignore and disregard the role of colonialism and racialization in the construction of patriarchal capitalism. Just as the witch hunts in Europe reoriented the social relations of gender as part of primitive accumulation, so too did colonialism impose European gender relations upon colonial subjects. The heteronormative European gender binary and modes of gendered oppression were exported, altered and racialized within the colonial and slave contexts as an essential part of the genocidal domination of colonialism and slavery. Third mention of genocide today. Jesus. As Francois Verges writes, Colonized women were reinvented as women in light of the norms, criteria and discriminatory practices used in medieval Europe. Racialized women have therefore faced a double subjugation, that of colonizers and that of colonized men. Before slavery and colonialism, there were women as a European social category, but afterwards there were white women and others. For white women to exist, there needed to be a system of racialization to create the other women. And as Federici argues, with this colonialism, the construction of the witch changed from a European form to now take on the form of the native or the slave women. And with the creation of white womanhood, came the exploitation of whiteness. Bourgeois and liberal feminists of the 17th century frequently invoked slavery as synonymous with their experience as an oppressed class within society. And while it's certainly true that women were and are oppressed, these sort of invocations obscured the particular horror of slavery as a system and the benefits afforded to white women because they were white. White women couldn't vote, but they could and frequently did own people, black people. Similarly, during the battles for women's and black suffrage in the US, white suffragettes would often invoke the inferiority of black men to justify why they, as white women, should get the vote before black men. And in fact, champion of women's suffrage, Susan B. Anstey, once said that she would rather cut off her right arm than advocate for black suffrage before women's. Similar dynamics appeared in Europe, with black people and natives being posed as inherently inferior to white women, and therefore highlighting the singular injustice of white women's political disenfranchisement. Racialization fundamentally altered and complicated the relationships of patriarchy and capitalism. And we can see again how these forms of gendered and sexed oppression were altered by systems of racialization when we look at the way that different social roles were afforded to white and black women both during and after slavery. In Angela Davis's uh, Women, Race and Class, which is an amazing book <laughs> that everyone should read. I've read it twice, it's great. Davis shows how systemic racism fundamentally shaped the social relations of patriarchy throughout the history of the USA. For example, Davis argues firstly that by forcing slave women into more than just a labor role, but into the role of producing future generations of slaves through childbearing, institutionalized the sexual abuse of slave women in such a powerful way that it outlasted the specific conditions of slavery and morphed into the rape culture that still infects society today. The ownership of women's bodies, which is a particularity of patriarchy, is inseparable from racialization and slavery. And furthermore, Davis argues that black women were given a particular class character, different from that of white women in the post-slavery era. Black women were far more likely to be engaged in wage labor than their 
white counterparts. But this waged labour was often of a socially reproductive character, in that it involved maintaining the household for wealthier white women. Such labour was often extremely gruelling, hard work, and was often a site of sexual assault for black women. And as such shows how the creation of whiteness as a political category has fundamentally altered the construction of patriarchal and capitalist systems by altering who performs what roles in society. And we can still see this today in the way that a socially reproductive labour is shouldered not just by women, but by often racialized and migrant women. The roles of cleaning and of health and social care are still largely placed on the shoulders of black and racialized migrant women, who are confined to particularly precarious positions with insecure and outsourced employment, low wages, migrant status and few labour rights. If the responsibility over social reproduction to women as such generated a particular class character for women, then the further shift of such work to racialized and migrant women indicates that class, race and gender are all interactive, all part of one system and not in opposition to one another. Now you might be thinking of a particular word right now, and that word is intersectional. But I want to offer a specific and particular critique of the limits of that sort of framing, but for that I'm gonna need my whiteboard and I'm gonna need you, the dudes, we're gonna have to switch places. Oh you, oh, you want us to move? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <sighs> Take a look at my whiteboard. Isn't it good? So here I have represented intersectionality, which don't get me wrong, has been profoundly useful for generating insights into the systemic relationship between class, gender and race. But intersectionality is a theoretical tendency to view these different systems as constructed separately from each other only to interact externally, whether that's on like an individual or an organisation or like the legal system. They are ontologically blech, distinct, meaning that class or capitalism is a thing, gender or patriarchy is a thing, race and systemic racism is a thing unto itself, only to interact externally within the world. And I think this is wrong, or at least limiting to a degree. Rather than separate systems, I think it's more accurate to view these things of class, gender and race, not as externally related constructions, but as internally co-constitutive parts of a social totality, a world system. A world system that we can call capitalism. Do you like how I drew a big circle around it to illustrate my point? Just, just fucking top-notch teaching there. Hire me to teach your tutorials. I'll, I can draw circles around lots of things. So, the, so these things don't just interact on a person or a particular site, but they're constantly changed by the relations between and within each other, and between each other and the social totality of capitalism. So for example, the, the entire construction of gender and of patriarchy was fundamentally altered by the addition of race. It wasn't just that these two things interacted externally, but they changed the complete construction of each other. And through that, they also changed the construction of the nature of class. It didn't just interrelate, but they changed, they fundamentally changed what these things mean by their interactions within this social totality. Do you get me? Because of the social, social totality. totality. In fact, it might be more accurate to say that these, class, gender, race, aren't things at all. They're just relations between various different sites of exploitation. This is hard to explain, uh, hence the whiteboard, which I think is, is going beautifully. But this is important, not just for me like wanking myself off over theory, but because it has real material impacts on our analysis and the praxis which emerges from such analysis. Ensuring that gender and race aren't just identity issues uh, related to, but often cast in opposition to class, but actually class relations themselves, then we can reorient our politics to always be necessarily anti-capitalist. And we can always make sure that our anti-capitalist politics is necessarily anti-patriarchal and necessarily anti-racist. So if you're not doing that, like, what the fuck? What the fuck are you doing? What are you even fucking doing? Why would you not do that? Get a grip. I say fuck too much for this ever to be used in teaching material, don't I? If I want a teaching job, I should say fuck less. I 
I say fuck too much. I've said fuck too much in this uh, in this sentence. Fuck. With this model, we can analyze how whiteness is instrumentalized as a particular class relation to put white workers in the global north above black and brown women in the global south. We can generate social movements that take as a given that overcoming patriarchy, racism and capitalism isn't three distinct tasks, but one inseparable movement that all of the oppressed have to walk together. We can analyse why dudes don't rock. And finally, we can analyse how the construction of the neoliberal girl boss isn't just vapid and empty, but is actively harmful to liberation. That's right, we're finally talking about the neoliberal girl boss, baby. Here we go. Didn't mean to throw that pen that far. So, with the development of patriarchal and racial capitalism as a single system laid out, I think it's finally time to turn our attention to the void of shite that is the neoliberal girl boss feminism. Uh, do you think Margaret Thatcher had girl power? Yes, of course. First, let's describe what neoliberal feminism is. Neoliberalism as a political ideology seeks to reshape the individual in the name of a utopian ideal of the free market. It's not about small state government, it's about reshaping the state and individual to more effectively fit into this particular ideal. And for a, a more in-depth discussion, you could go to any number of my other videos on neoliberalism, which are many at this point. But for our purposes here, what's important is that neoliberalism seeks to centre the individual and the households as like the prime sites of political action, and seeks to reforge those sites into being individualistic, uh, personally responsible, competitive and entrepreneurial. This obviously has huge implications for any form of feminist subjectivity which develops within this particular political ideological context. This subjectivity imposed by neoliberalism creates a feminist subject who's not really concerned with overturning the entire system of racial and patriarchal capitalism, but of navigating such systems as a personally responsible neoliberal actor so that they can reach powerful positions within them. And this is partly done too by limiting the particular choices afforded to women within society. Like they've got to conform to this particular uh, neoliberal model to have a decent life. This is why you see such a heavy focus on representation within the halls of corporate and political power as being the prime goal for the neoliberal feminist. And also why you see such a valorization of such women who embody the ideals of the neoliberal capitalist subject. Uh, do you think Margaret Thatcher had girl power? Yes, of course. The girl boss is an ambitious and entrepreneurial subject, and the neoliberal feminist is a capitalist subject. And if we accept my description of the social totality where capitalism is patriarchy, we can see how such feminisms are ultimately, you know, hollow. Liberation from sex and gender oppression just can't come at the hands of that sort of neoliberal feminism. It just can't. And this becomes extremely clear when you see how neoliberal girl boss feminism doesn't even challenge the core assumptions of patriarchal capitalism, like the public-private distinction, the focus on the household, and the devaluation of social reproductive work, which is still placed on the shoulders of racialized women. It doesn't just not challenge those assumptions, but actually actively reinforces them. And in fact, when you look at two like seminal works of neoliberal feminism, Lean In by Facebook COO, uh, don't really know what a COO is, but operating officer? Chief operating officer? Maybe. Yeah, Lean In by, <laughs> Lean in by Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg and Why Women Still Can't Have It All by former Hillary Clinton aide, uh, what's her name? Anne-Marie Slaughter. Anne-Marie Slaughter, which is a wild, wild name for anyone who's <laughs> worked with Hillary Clinton to have. What's going on there? Any vote that might lead to war should be hard but I cast it with conviction. And when, when you look at these two works, uh, you can see how, despite some sort of superficial differences between them, and sometimes they are posed as like competing 
visions of feminism, but that's, I don't think that's quite right. Uh, they because they, they both uh, they both carry with them certain underlying assumptions about the world and about neoliberal feminism. And in particular, they both reinforce this idea of the work-life balance. This notion firstly reinforces, but also complicates slightly, the idea of the public-private distinction, which is so essential for separating and subordinating the role of social reproduction within capitalist society. Secondly, in constructing this idea of the work-life balance, neoliberal feminism doesn't just not challenge the idea that women should be responsible for social reproductive work in the household, but adds that they should also be engaged in wage labour in the, in the labour market as personally responsible capitalist subjects. As a leader and as a manager, I have always acted on the mantra, if family comes first, work does not come second, life comes together. As opposed to the housewife of the 19th and 20th century, the neoliberal feminist subject is constructed as both a mother and a worker. And indeed, those roles aren't always entirely separate. While the private role of social reproduction is reinforced by this sort of work-life balance subjectivity and the stripping back of publicly funded childcare, healthcare and social care under neoliberalism, you know, these are matters of the individual, not of the state. It's the individual's duty to be prepared for these things. There's also a sort of public duty for women to engage in social reproduction so that they can create the next generation of workers and that, you know, labour power as a commodity is maintained. This has meant that women under neoliberalism are often viewed as the sort of boss of this heteronormative family unit. You know, the mum, the dad and the two and a half kids. And consistent with neoliberalism's goal to sort of reorient everything along market lines, this heteronormative family is reframed as like an entrepreneurial family, it's like a small business in of itself, which reinforces ideas of people as like human capital. You can see just an astoundingly, that's a beautiful example of this in this quote from a magazine called Working Mother. It's just it's beautiful stuff. If I could go back in time, I would announce my pregnancy with a sign taped to my belly that said, I'm creating demand. From a business perspective, I am the supply and the demand. I am supplying a person who will one day generate demand. Instead of the gift wrapped baby shoes I gave my husband, I would wrap up a wad of cash to show my boss how I was helping to drive the economy and pay into the pension system. Or perhaps I'd announce it with a teeny tiny briefcase to highlight the potential future business leader I was carrying. I couldn't believe it when I first saw this quote. Uh, thanks to Lila for sending it to me because it so perfectly encapsulates that link between neoliberal girl boss feminism and social reproduction. It really highlights that internal contradiction of neoliberal feminism because on the one hand you've got like the role of social reproduction is given this value. They're, they're, they're uh, reinforcing that there is like capital, there is value behind producing people for capitalism. But on the other hand it's sort of like embraced as something that's good that people, that children are given this sort of alienated, horribly dehumanising value within the economy. Like, you're just producing cash for the economy, not a person. What's a child but an investment in future labour power? <laughs> it also reinforces the idea that this is the role that women should play in society. And almost like that that role is empowering in some way, which is bizarre to me. <laughs> it's Honestly, I could write a paper about this one quote. It's just it is beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful quote and, and how horrible it is. However, this story of women being responsible for both economic and social reproductive activity is given a further class character. When we consider that for many wealthy and often white women, the role of social reproduction, you know, housework and childcare, is often delegated to a household staff made up of often migrant and racialized women. 
And this is encouraged by such neoliberal policies like the Canadian Living Caregiver Policy, which used migrant labour to specifically fill the gaps and plug the gaps in previously publicly funded uh, childcare. In this sense then, the heteronormative neoliberal household really is transformed into an enterprise, with a staff whose job it is to produce the next generation of future labour power for the capitalist economy while still reinforcing divisions in social reproductive labour and reproducing racial and class divisions. Hardly a challenge to the patriarchy. The illusion of freedom under capitalism is clearly shown here. Women under neoliberal capitalism are free to enter the workforce and remove themselves from the direct domination of their husbands and the direct control of a single wage family. But now they're under the domination of the wage relation and still expected to maintain that social reproductive role. Patriarchy hasn't really been eroded here, it's simply been altered. So this is the neoliberal feminist subject, the, the girl boss. A personally responsible, entrepreneurial capitalist subject who can successfully navigate the structures of patriarchal capitalist power, while still being responsible for the social reproductive roles within the heteronormative family unit with children, even if she delegates such responsibilities to uh, migrant and racialized women as her staff. This sort of neoliberal girlboss feminism not only doesn't challenge particular structures of patriarchal capitalism, it reifies them and reinforces them in certain ways. The heteronormative household and the particular class relation of devaluing social reproduction and placing it on the shoulders of particularly racialized and migrant women isn't just not undermined, but actively reinforced. Such feminism has to be challenged not just as facile or ridiculous, but as actively harmful to any sort of liberation project. Well, so what you're saying is that Margaret Thatcher, yeah. Theresa May, Hillary Clinton, they're yeah. shite, basically. But, yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess so. Well, why couldn't you just say that? Why did you need all of this? We've been sitting here for ages and we could be rocking. Firstly, I hate that there's part four parts to this. I I normally have three parts. Three parts make sense. You got one part, two parts, three parts. Four four parts? Yeah. No, don't like it. Don't like having four parts. It seems messy. But this is part four. I want here to just quickly draw together two ways in which neoliberal feminism is used to devalue the lives and alternative subjectivities of women who don't fit within this narrow ideal. Firstly, as I've spoken about, Neoliberal feminism seeks to create a subject who's both entrepreneurial and engages in the social reproduction necessary to create the next generation of labour power for capitalist production. But what this also does is it makes this type of person a normative ideal, meaning that anyone who doesn't meet this ideal is devalued as a person. We see this a lot and I talk about it a bit more detail in my Necropolitics video about how uh, particularly working class uh, women and their families are seen as scrounging off society and of failing in their social reproductive role of building the next generation of good workers. They're then viewed as necropolitical waste and marginalised by society. And this dynamic is also particularly strong for disabled women and carers who are systematically devalued as necropolitical waste. And this is also frequently a deeply racialised project with uh, particularly black women in the US being framed as like welfare queens. They're, you know, they're, they're supposedly leeching off society with loads of children who aren't fitting into this neoliberal ideal. And I also think this is inextricably linked with that systemic regime of sexual abuse of black slave women uh, to produce the next generation of slaves, viewing them as breeders of the next generation of slaves. And I think this has a role of both simultaneously devaluing black women as a racialized subject and reifying white women as the ideal uh, neoliberal girl boss subject, particularly in the settler colonial context where the white woman is viewed as this sort of uh, discursive, this ideal of the frontier woman conquering new lands, except it's updated to 
conquering the political and economic sphere and is positioned against uh, native and racialized women who are seen as seen as lesser essentially it's not possible in my view to delink this form of neoliberal feminism from the structures of racial oppression it emerged from them and perpetuates them and this is felt really keenly in the role that neoliberal feminism plays in the perpetuation of imperialism, of Western imperialism. This reified ideal of bourgeois and liberal feminism is used to uh, position white culture, and I use that term loosely, it's used to position white culture internally and the West as an international construct as being inherently more morally superior than all of these all these backward countries in the global south that don't have real women's rights. And it does this moralizing while at the same time legitimizing a political and economic system which has the global north actively exploiting migrant and racialized women within its borders and leeches off the value and production of women in the global south. A clear example of this is how Muslim women are uh, oppressed in places like France which have used feminist language and mobilized feminist language to justify things like banning headscarves for Muslim women because because what's what's more feminist than telling women what they can and can't wear that's that's real feminism good job France and then you've got Islamic countries being framed as like singularly and inherently oppressive to women uh, because they are Muslim countries thus justifying uh, either economic sanctions against those countries or in some cases outright imperial violence against them, uh, obviously during which violence against women massively increases. This is of course despite the fact that many of those oppressive regimes are only in place because of Western imperialism overthrowing democratically elected governments. This civilizational feminism has been part of liberal feminism for centuries which only means that it is deeply embedded within the construction of neoliberal feminist girl bosses. Uh, you know where your dad's at, girl power? The construction of this ideal of the neoliberal feminist is exported across the globe with violence in tow. So this has been a sprawling and frankly kind of hard fucking hard video to write. I mean, who'd have thought trying to draw together several centuries of patriarchy and colonialism in less than 5,000 words would be hard, but here we are. Patriarchy, racialization, and capitalism are not three distinct systems which then externally intersect. Rather, they are all mutually co-constitutive, co-building parts of one social totality. The social reproductive role which has been placed on women since the transition to capitalism and the particular racialized dimensions of that role which have emerged through colonialism have served as one way in which gender and race have been afforded a particular class character, you know, rather than just an identity, just identity politics. These are class issues, not just identity issues. As such, for any feminist project to be truly liberatory and truly able to bring down the patriarchy, it must necessarily be anti-capitalist, it must necessarily be anti-imperialist, and any anti-capitalism should necessarily be anti-patriarchal and anti-racist, or else it's not really anti-capitalism. The neoliberal feminist girl boss is none of these things. Do you think she effectively utilized girl power by funneling money to illegal paramilitary death squads in Northern Ireland? Instead, neoliberal feminism reifies capitalism, the essentialist social reproductive role of women in society and the class benefits afforded to whiteness, while simultaneously being used to devalue women who don't conform to these neoliberal ideals and to justify Western imperialism on the normative grounds of hegemonic Western values. In short, it's uh, shite. But by understanding the social totality of capitalism and the role that neoliberal feminism plays, you thought the whiteboard was gone? The whiteboard is never gone. It's always with me. The whiteboard is always with me. But by understanding that social totality, we can understand that oppositional feminism, whether that's Marxist, uh, decolonial or social reproductive, is absolutely essential 
for overcoming capitalist patriarchy, overthrowing capitalist sexual and gender social relations, and just making a better society. As Australian Indigenous activist Leela Watson said, If you have come to help me, then you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Until all of humanity is liberated from patriarchal racial capitalism, dudes will never truly rock. No one rocks until we all rock. And that's just a fact. That was beautiful, that was beautiful, that was beautiful. <laughs> this rock. Thanks guys. <laughs> Welcome to the end of the video. We're here again, you've made it. Well done. Uh, I hope you found that interesting, uh, entertaining. Um, any other positive emotions that you might feel? Uh, I hope you find all of them. Uh, so first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, Marina Dove, Mitch Waifu on Twitter, uh, Catherine YT on YouTube, um, Ponderful, and uh, Dominic Remy for all for uh, providing notes when I when I sent them the script and for providing uh, voiceovers when I needed them. They're all they're all stars, every one of them. Uh, and now to thank my beautiful patrons. Uh, so, uh, thanks to Paul Singleton, Tamash Kispeter, Seamus Morrison, Stephanie Beverly, Sinan Kos, Jam to Pot, Nelly Zacheva, Mercutio, Daniel Hughes, Hey Joe, Luke Evans, Mackenzie Iyer, Gary Dillon, Teo Adewale, Some Dumbass, Callum, Zankarastan77, Paul Bartley, uh, Peter Bakalek, Charlie Hallam, Dan Wheatley, James Fielder, Jane Pickering, Tyler Dadio, uh, my ultimate muse, Lila, uh, Alec the Lad, Battle Whisk, Finley Bewick Copley, Harry Hanford, Jens, Joe, Mackenzie Milton, Nemo, and Paul Bartley. They're all they're all just the, the most beautiful people. Uh, and and you know, thanks very much. If you've uh, enjoyed this, uh, please you know like and subscribe. Uh, subscribe to me on Patreon as well, or give a one-off donation via Ko-fi. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'll leave you, leave you here. Love you. Bye-bye.